weird as this may sound, my story is not remarkable because I lived it. Like I know all this and I know how the ending goes and I know it's not remarkable, but to somebody else hearing it, it is. And they'll hear it Mm -hmm. when they need to hear it and they'll take from it what they need to take. And the true is same for everyone out there. Mm -hmm. Each and every one of us has an impactful, important, powerful story to be told. And that's why I said in the beginning, don't compare yours to mine. It's not a comparison. There's no report card. There's no scale. Our guest today is known as the queen of engagement and named one of the top 50 most impactful people of LinkedIn in 2021 out of nearly 1 billion business professionals. She is a 20 plus year entrepreneur of a thriving private practice. She's an educator, keynote speaker, and coach who helps others understand the value and power of personal content on social media. Welcome to the show, founder of Chick with a Tool Belt, Nancy Barrows. Hey, good morning. Thank you. And uh, well, welcome Katya Mimi as well, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say her name? Katya Mimi. Katya Mimi. If people are listening and not watching, you wonder, whoa, the heck are they talking about right out of the gate? It's uh, Nancy's uh, beautiful cat here. Little Gray Cat is her nickname? Yeah, she's Little Gray. and uh, Little Gray. The, yes, the, the live stream cat, live stream kitty. It's funny, I keep joking that I'm going to start an Instagram for her because, you know, <laughs> you know, when you set out and you're marketing and you're building your brand, you never think that a little gray cat is going to be, right, part of your branding. And here she is and she's made it it's so. It's funny. I have friends that, that do that for their cats and dogs and like they have more social media followers than I do. It's like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Your, your dog's a celebrity. I am. Yes. Yeah, she'll be little gray cat. I could see her being a top influencer on IG right now. Um, and if people <laughs> so are wondering how they can... one of LinkedIn top 50, right? <laughs> yeah, she's going to be, she'll be at least 49. Um, so guys, check out voiceyourvibe.com. That's where you can find Nancy hanging out. And then also on LinkedIn, as you know, which obviously you don't get the top 50 if you're not um, on there and on there consistently. And you are. I believe that's actually how we connected is through a friend um, on LinkedIn. And then also social media. I mean, aside from LinkedIn, you're you're all over. So what I'm going to do is put that all in the show notes, make it clickable. Nobody has to worry about spelling it or typing it in. Uh, they can go ahead and click through to get, get to uh, see what you're doing. And then also at the end, I know we'll talk a little bit about how people can schedule 15 minutes with you via your link tree, which I'll have in the show notes at Voice Your Vibe. Uh, so Nancy, you and I have been talking about doing this for a long time. We met about a month ago, and we're finally here making it happen. Welcome to Mike Up. Thank you so much. I've been so looking forward to our conversation after we had our first, you know, meet conversation as people. Um, it's been something I've really been looking forward to being here with you and the conversation that we're going to have today. And thank you for the yeah. beautiful introduction. You're welcome. Now, guys, I want to share something. When Nancy and I first met... It's one of those things, usually you meet someone for the first time, you kind of get like, it starts at surface level and you start to dig a little deeper and you ask a couple more questions and you find that you're like at some mutual interest. It's like, you know, after the the cup of coffee is halfway down and all of a sudden you feel like you know them a little bit better. Well, Nancy and I got into a really deep, serious um, conversation that I was one of the, it's hard for me to say because it was, it was, it's a devastating story. We're going to cover it as much as Nancy wants to share it because I wanted her on the show here. The whole reason that guests come on Mic'd Up is to help our audience out. And I know that's what you're excited to do. And um, we don't always help them with just the the easy conversations or the the happy moments. There's some some things that happen in life that can be devastating, but we also can turn around and say, it's hard to say this in the moment, but things happen for us, not always to us. As long as we can turn around and say, you know what, I went through this and I'm not able to change it, can't change the past, but I can change how my attitude towards the future. And now I'm going to help other people who maybe had a similar struggle that don't have any help and I'm willing to help them. And I've experienced that personally with my divorce and some business struggles early on in my journey as an entrepreneur. And I know that's what we talked about you coming on the show to do, but there's also a million other beautiful things that we can talk about too. So I want to make sure that you're here talking about the exciting things Hashtag radiating real, which I see uh, you, you're using quite a bit. Let's do this. Before we go into that story, I just kind of teased that you shared with me when we first met. I'd love to hear about, you know, how did you get to that top 50 influencer position? 
there's a lot of people listening to this right now that are looking to up their LinkedIn game and their social media game. And, and you talk a lot about being real, being transparent, and how that actually helps out with social media connectivity to an audience. So share what, what's most important about being real. So yeah, I talk about radiating real, which came from my own experience of taking my mask off and, you know, for the first time in my life, 100% committing to being 100% real 100% of the time. And what that sparked was unconditional love and acceptance from people. And so I thought, wow, you know, people are commenting on how real and authentic and genuine. And I know some of those words are just thrown around, but it occurred to me that it must not happen very often if people are commenting on it. And so, yes, I started the, one of the first things I did on LinkedIn was start the hashtag radiating real movement. And, you know, I love the story. I, I'm so proud to be named one of the top 50 most impactful people of LinkedIn. Of course, it's a huge honor. It's a huge platform, um, but it has so many layers to it. One is that it's peer voted. And so it's, people really saying like you had an impact, like in the last year, you impacted my life in such a way, right, that I want to honor you, which already, if I do nothing else, I'm, I'm a pretty successful, fortunate woman. But beyond that, I love the story because it's truly anyone can do it. Because at the time I had been on LinkedIn for 10 months, that's it, 10 months. Mm -hmm. And all I did was show up. I didn't know mm -hmm. anything about LinkedIn. I didn't know about metrics, the do's, the don'ts, or whatever the the rumors and rules are, whether yeah. or not they exist and all of that. I just showed up. And the story you were talking about earlier was part of that. But the reality is when at 10 months in, when I was voted into, you know, this group of peers that I admire and look up to and have the utmost respect for, I only had 2,500 followers. I didn't have thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions. Like, it was just me doing sure. me, showing up, being me and radiating real. And part of that is, you know, we're all living life. We are all out there, especially during the pandemic. We know how ugly, snotty and unsexy life can be. However, we're really reluctant to share that on our social media, you know, whether it be for pure social motives or for business reasons, right? We, we, we just are afraid to put ourselves out there. And what occurs when you do, this is why I love to talk about the power of personal content, which mm -hmm. I'm going to stop for a second and remind people personal and private are different because there's so much mm -hmm. fear around sharing our, our real selves and our personal content. But Radiating real, being real is not cracking open your chest and telling everybody everything, every secret you've ever had. That's, that's not real, right? That's the opposite side of being real. We're back to the curated content, which I'm really making an effort here to change what people think of as curated content, that our curated yeah. content actually be this range of real, right? I, I have posted um, after crying and told what the situation was. I have posted after a night of going to sleep with my makeup on and having raccoon eyes. I've, I've posted about mm -hmm. my depression. I've posted about things I'm celebrating. I've posted, you know, bits of my story. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely get into that. But if you're starting on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. part of what radiating real and the chick with the tool belt is, you know, I love working with clients and I, it's, it's a coaching because there's not a better word for it, but I like to call it Sherpa. Like I'm a Sherpa. Mm -hmm. Everything you need is already within you, right? I'm just guiding and going with you and holding your hand when those scary parts come up and figuring out how we navigate through those to find your voice and to get comfortable mm -hmm. using it on your social media. Because the reality is whether for personal reasons and you're feeling disconnected or you're looking for a wider network or you're, you know, which is a lot of what happened during the pandemic. I was that woman that lived alone with two cats. You know, I was isolated. And it's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I got on LinkedIn, believe it or not, was sort of like a friend of mine's like, social and, and, and yeah, yeah, it's the social contact. And for business, the reality is it, it's always been this way, but Corporate and business has changed permanently. The culture is different now. I can no longer have a picture of like my dog in the background and, you know, me fishing and that just be what you see of me and, and assume that that's going to have you relate to me. Like, oh, I fish too, mm -hmm. you know, and behind this big desk and in the sterile office, or even if you have the cozy office, you know, we were in each other's homes. We mm -hmm. were put on the same level in this terms of we were all struggling through this. We all had our right. fears and frustrations. We all were turning our homes into our offices and, and figuring out all the different variables, whether it's animals, children, lighting, you know, time zones. And we became people again to one another. Mm -hmm. And as humans, we want to see one another succeed. 
And we want to do business with people we know, like, and trust. One of my goals of being out here wherever I am, whether it be on LinkedIn or a podcast or YouTube or, you know, any of the social media platforms that I'm, I'm jumping around in is to make people feel seen, heard, loved, and valued. Yeah. That's it. That if I can do that, what a privilege, what a privilege. And again, by showing up that way, I mean, I'm showing up this morning and I said to you, you're getting radiating real. You know, it was, it, we started early this morning for me out in California and I could have put a full mm -hmm. face of makeup on and not that if you're listening to this, you'd see me anyway, but I know we have this going out on YouTube and it's like, nope, this, this yeah. is it. I'm still in my pajamas. Yeah. I mean, I can certainly, sorry, <laughs> if you're just listening, you don't get to see the, the really gorgeous. Oh, know, there we go. I'm showing. <laughs> yes. I've got my, my, there from I, a friend that doesn't went to get London, more real than I, that. It, <laughs> but hey, everyone who's listening or watching right now, you learned yeah. about me, right? On a mm -hmm. personal level. And if you've done this before, right, then we just connected on some level. When we share our personal content, we are going to find people right. who have at least one, we have at least one thing in common with. You know, I always mm -hmm. joke, it's like, I want to be doing even myself, I want to be working with people who understand that if I'm 10 minutes late to something, because my cat vomited on the way out of the house, they go, Oh, yeah, I get it. And not, you know, I'm sorry, you're 10 minutes over, I can't take your call. Now, granted, right. there's times we have to do that, we have schedules. But for the most part, I want to know who I'm doing business with. And mm -hmm. that's what people want. Also, think about what you're looking for. And my journey on LinkedIn was really about showing up and I can, I can share my story now if, if we, if now is a good time about really how real I got when I got onto to LinkedIn yeah. and social media. I'm going to absolutely have you do that, but I'd just like to pause to interject a little bit and just say, thank you so much Please. for coming on, being real and reminding us all again about the, the power of that vulnerability. Look, we're not saying, I don't want to speak for you. I'll speak for myself, but um, I agree with everything you say. So I'm second. I'm seconding Nancy's uh, thoughts on this, and it's like it's hard to come out and be vulnerable because you, you feel you're exposed, and a lot of people are going to be judging you. So of course, it's not easy. The other alternative is just trying to show everybody your highlight reel, which is really what happens on like Facebook and and Instagram. Is you you always see the best angle of everybody and the best vacation and. You know, and all that. And I look, I do this myself. So I realize, like, as you're saying it, it's a reminder, look, be more vulnerable. And I think of a friend of mine, Sarah Grace Hallis, who went through um, a crazy situation where she uh, was getting divorced and then, at, like, afterwards found out she was pregnant. And a crazy story about um, how she's moving in with a new roommate and her roommate becomes, like, basically the doula. And, and there's this crazy story. But what she did was, she um, documented it like you did, like out out to her audience, and she was very real and just sharing like the updates with everybody. Like, oh my god, I went to the sonogram. Like, and she did a little YouTube thing behind it. It was because she she was like going through it, and the support of her community was helping her, and she was also helping other people get through their craziness too. Because everybody has a different struggle, but can relate. Like you said with the the cat vomiting story. Like, oh my god, I know that. Or yeah, I was running late to a meeting, so I just basically threw on my or I kept my pajama pants on and threw on a sweater or something. Like whatever. Um, we're like two plus years into the pandemic, I'm sure everybody can relate to a story when you're not in your, your best outfit on a Zoom call or whatever. So I want to just say how important it is that really getting to that place is what's going to allow someone... The reminder here is to help others. If you're, not, if you're never vulnerable or real or allow someone in, then you're really not coming to them or meeting them at a place where they totally can like know, like, and trust you and believe that um, you're listening to them. And you said the word like being seen, being loved, being heard. And if you're just coming in as like Mr. or Mrs. Best Instagram Reel, you're not really in a place where they're going to relate to you. So I think it's so important. I wanted to stop and make sure people don't think it's just, oh, like I get what she's saying, but it's like, let's all try to really do that. Because um, I said social content earlier, what I really meant is more social connectivity not so much the content. Content's important, the quality of it and, and what you put into it, but it's really the connection behind it. And so obviously getting to that level, it's not like you came out saying, I want to be top 50. But the reason you got there is because your connection to your community was what you really mm -hmm. cared about, right? 
Absolutely. And, absolutely. Yeah. And I didn't even know there was such a thing as top 50. I, you know, I really <laughs> had no idea what was even out there, right. the possibilities. And you're absolutely right. It's this vulnerability and two things you talked about, the vulnerability and that we're doing it for others, right? Vulnerability, yeah. first of all, if you, in life, we know, you know, you get you you get to know one another and you really become friends and family in that space of vulnerability you know learning how to be there with someone for someone and we talk a lot about safe space and i talk about brave space because i love safe space safe space is so important where we all agree that you're going to get vulnerable and we're going to we're going to be here to support you right we we've got you whereas brave space to me is where we all say nope we're all going to get vulnerable together Right? None of us is, we're all going to be equally exposed. We're all going to be equally scared here, but we're going to do it together. And here's where we're going to really learn about one another and become that support system, whether it's for cheering you on or celebrating, you know, there's a million things in between, but it's right. in that vulnerability that we get to know one another. Cause like I said, we're all living life. I don't accept mm. apologies for living life or being human. And those are a lot of the things that we apologize for, right? We yeah. always apologize apologizing for the fact that we're living right. life and being human. And so no living life and being human is is gosh I'm aging myself is where it's at. You know like but it yeah, truly yeah. is. The other way where we're only showing the the glamour reel we're yeah. hurting one another and we're literally killing one another. People are comparing and they have that internal report card and that they're not, I had, you know, luckily not to the, the space of suicidal ideation, but I had a mm -hmm. failure narrative in my head around my divorce because three of my very close friends had gone through divorces at different times. And when I was going through mine, I was crying and, you know, oh my gosh, like, you know, I can't go to work today because I'm not going to be able to keep it together or, you know, missing my ex-husband, you know, and, mm -hmm. and going through life and, and hitting these milestones where things we had done together and we've been together so long that there was nothing in my life. I can keep going. And again, another familiar story for people, I'm sure. And, you know, why I got divorced, another familiar story for people, right? And the more I share all these things, you know, we didn't, we were best friends, but we ended up being roommates and we both deserved more. And that's a hard thing. Hey, I'm going to put that right here. That's a hard reason, quote unquote, to get divorced. Because everybody wants you to have a good, hard, tangible reason why you can't stay in this relationship, right? Yeah. And for ourselves, we tend to want that. He's beating me. She cheated on me. There's something with money, right? But, but just not both people not being in their highest potential yeah. is, is a reason, right? A reason we, we, we choose. To I went through it myself. To, it's this darkness in your heart that only you know is not something that's reversible. And if you feel right. that and you elongate the process i feel like you can do more damage and if you add children into the mix which we had we have our daughter together which is beautiful mm -hmm. and i do it a million times over for isabel she's two and we also knew that like she's not going to know any different and we both were at places where we didn't see patching or healing we were pretty cordial mm -hmm. thankfully it wasn't you know uh as bad as some of the some of the stories i have heard about different blowout divorces and stuff oh, we're gonna get right oh, to no, your story i, I was yeah, I tried everything. So I knew and I share this because I know there's people out there who are probably thinking this. I thought I was failing a divorce because I was mm -hmm. a mess, whereas my other friends seem to do it so gracefully. Well, they did it so gracefully because what were they showing? You know, they were only showing sure. the parts and the days. And part of it was convincing themselves. Right. It's not like mm -hmm. it's not like they were meaning to deceive or deceive yeah. me as a friend. But until I said something to one of them, they said, no, I was a mess. I had this narrative because of what I had seen out there. So yes, back to my mm -hmm. story. Go ahead. I'll let you ask the question. I didn't mean to interrupt. You. Yeah, well, I'm going to set it back up. I, obviously, we've teased it a few times. It is a really heavy story. I'm going to say mm -hmm. too, one of the things about your, your LinkedIn success early on, you mentioned you had only 2,000 followers, which, hey, I'd rather have 2,000 real followers and connections that know me or that I've had a, a like a, some kind of reason for them to connect with me and follow then vanity metrics of like, oh, I got 20,000 people on LinkedIn, but mm -hmm. like 19,000 of them don't know me. So uh, just a reminder to everybody out there, we're not chasing numbers, we're chasing real connections. And you can see that with Nancy's story, she had 2,000 really good connections that cared about her. And that's what allowed people to actually tune into her content. She got way more uh, visibility because of that, opposed to either buying followers or just pressing that connection button all day long and having no connection. So reminder, again, that's a great situation where 2,000 real followers 
uh, helped you get your story out way more than 20,000 fake followers would have. So that's really big. Before we get into your story, I do want to do this. I want to get our uh, two-minute timeout. We're going to um, give some love to our sponsors. Talk about giving love to each other and, and to one another. We're going to give some love to our sponsors. We're going to take a two-minute quick timeout. We'll be right back with Nancy. Podcasting is a great way to engage with your audience and stay consistently relevant. The only problem is you don't have the time or desire to produce your own show. You simply want it done for you. And that's where Social Chameleon comes in. All you need to do is press record and upload the files. We'll handle the rest. From planning, production, post-production, distribution, and digital marketing, we have you covered. We realize that times are tough and funds are tight. And Social Chameleon believes in building supportive business relationships. By clicking on the link in this promo, we'll provide you seven free podcasting tips to get started, as well as a free 30-minute online consultation. This is the perfect opportunity for entrepreneurs, keynote speakers, industry experts, influencers, and anybody who has a personal brand. With Social Chameleon, we help you build a brand that is out of this world. We're ready and waiting. So what are you waiting for? Click on the link to get started today. Hey guys, it's Mike. I'd like to give a proper shout out to Navigator Bookkeeping. Look, for a long time, I ran my business without really understanding the full financial picture. I used my gut and my bank account balance to make decisions, which led to some poor choices and constant stress over my business's finances. I knew something needed to change. At the beginning of 2021, I made a decision that helped pave a more clear path for my business. I started working with Navigator Bookkeeping. Since then, my bookkeeping has been handled for me. I now understand the full financial story of my business, making important financial decisions much easier now, and it helps me plan for where my business is going. I highly recommend giving Navigator Bookkeeping an opportunity to help your business. Check them out at navigatingyourbooks.com. Again, that's navigatingyourbooks.com. It's time to know the full financial story of your business. All right, we're back in action with Nancy Barrows. You guys can connect with her on social media. I have her website, also her link tree. Uh, Voice Your Vibe is in the show notes. It's all clickable. She's offering a free 15-minute consultation with herself. She's going to share more about that in a moment. But about three maybe even a dozen times now, (laughs) somewhere in between three and 12 (laughs) times, I mentioned that when Nancy and I first connected, uh, you and I, we, 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 you shared the story with me and I really appreciated that you did because it was really hitting me. I have a seven year old daughter. I talked about Isabel on the show just a couple minutes ago, just knowing that you're what you were going through when you were around that age. I was on the edge of my seat. I was it was so heavy that I, I almost felt like I was like there, like being hurt by the actions. So the reason I'd like you to share your story is because people listening may either have a similar story and they never came out with it to, to get help, or they know somebody who's struggling with um, getting this or getting the help. And also the fact is, whether you went through something similar or totally different in a devastating way, I want you to see how now Nancy is using this to help other people and encouraging those of, of you that went through something tough. Just remember that the tough situation happened. If you can help others through it now that you've been through it, now it's almost like your superpower. So your shortcoming or devastating situation could be your superpower. And if you guys are listening to Nancy and I right now, she's smiling because I can tell she's ready to help. She's ready to serve. So please, with that, Nancy, if you want to share your story as much or as little as you'd like, we're all here to to listen and um, also help you out again. Because at this point in time, you could tell the story a million times, but uh, we're all here to support you. Thank you. And absolutely what we overcome become our superpowers. And there is, you know, hard for people to hear, but I have gratitude for all of it. And when I had gratitude for all of it, when I could finally see that this made me who I am today, and you get to a point where you like who you are, you start to have gratitude for the things that brought you there, no matter how, how traumatic or horrible they seem. And, you know, again, you you mentioned that it doesn't have to be the exact same with situation, which is 100% true, because trauma is trauma. Our brain perceives trauma when we're overloaded, and we all have our unique experiences in it. But one of the beautiful parts of trauma, if I can say it that way, is that there's there's a predictable outcome 
to when we experience trauma. So no matter the trauma, there's overlap between people's experiences and and what they carry with them forward from that Mm -hmm. trauma. So I encourage people, A, to not compare what they've been through to what I've been through. There's no competition. Mm-hmm. Nobody has a better trauma. Nobody has a, mm-hmm. you know, you know, a winning trauma. I've been through a lot for sure. Um, I had a ton of support and I'm so grateful and fortunate to be here on the other side, to be able to tell my story for people who can't yet tell their story for people who I may be a step ahead of, or several steps ahead of, and they, they can learn from what I've done and what I'm doing. And, you know, at the same time, I'm grateful that others share their story because there's people that are ahead of me and I'm still learning from, or I haven't been there yet. So as I share my story, it is difficult to hear. And I want to give everyone permission to feel anything that comes up because if you're feeling it, Mm -hmm. whether it be disgust, anger, pity, sadness, I felt it too. And those are completely mm-hmm. acceptable and unoffensive reactions to my story. Yeah. So, Thank you um, so much. you know, oh, you're welcome. I came on LinkedIn and about a week later I was live. Um, one of the parts of my LinkedIn story is about four months in, I was live eight hours a week. I had my own show that I was hosting and I was co-hosting uh, like three other shows at that time. But the first thing that I did live was a telethon for the XXO Connect platform, which is Jason Leibowitz's baby. And the platform mm-hmm. is about connection over convenience. It's about being real. It's about like, hey, let's, you suffer from depression. I suffered from depression. Let's talk. You know, we, we, we can understand one another. And so I was on the telethon talking about my childhood trauma and my childhood trauma. And mid sentence, it hit me. And I literally, in my head, I remember going, Nancy you're part of the problem. If you can't say the words, how can you expect anyone else to talk about this, right? How how are Mm -hmm. you, if you are uncomfortable with it, you know, everybody else is, how are we going to make this more comfortable? And without thinking, without wondering what was going to happen next, I shared, I shared my story. And I said, you know, my, exactly what I'm telling you is talking about childhood, childhood trauma is, is, is not all that helpful if I'm not willing to talk to you about what my trauma was. And so Mm -hmm. the first part of my trauma was that I was sexually abused by my grandfather from the time I was about five years old till I was 16. And it came out at 16 years old because I was at a summer program and a very wise 15 year old. We were, we were sitting around a bunch of us and talking about our first experiences with boys. And I started to cry and I may have left the room and I tried to just play it off. But, you know, in that moment of vulnerability, I shared with a girl that I had become close friends with why I was crying and in her wisdom and willingness. I mean, I think about a 15 year old girl going to tell this to an adult, knowing that you're quote unquote, betraying your friend, what bravery and wisdom she had, but she did. She went and Mm -hmm. told one of the adults in the program. And I had no, I mean, I work in education now. I know that there are laws and I know there are mandated reporters, but at the time I had no idea. I had no idea Mm -hmm. what was happening. And so, you know, the program came to me and told me, you know, hey, we've got to tell, we've got to report and we've got to let your parents know. Would you like to tell them or do you want us to? And I am so fortunate because already in my story, here's this secret that I had so carefully kept, like my life depended on it. And that's how it felt to me. It truly felt like, you know, by the time you get to 16, you know, it's wrong. And I had so much shame and I felt like I was as much at fault as him. I'm just as guilty. I never said no, I haven't stopped it. You know, people ask, why didn't you say no? Why didn't you? I I didn't even know it was an option. And it sounds crazy. But if you've been in my situation or any other situation where... Well, I mean, you were five mm-hmm. when it started. So you didn't right. know any, like, you didn't know as much right from wrong, even though you knew you had to, I don't want to speak for you again. And I'm very careful about doing that. Um, but at five, I don't know. I, I don't, but I could barely remember being five years old. So it's hard to say like what either. you're, what you're, yeah, what you're um, able to really process or it's your grandfather. So you're thinking, oh, mm-hmm. this is this is someone I like and trust and everybody's happy when we're all around. So when something, the total opposite emotions are connected to it, it's hard to decipher that for anybody, especially at that age. And then it went on for another 10, 11 years. So then you, at that point, it's like almost, um, ex- I don't want to say expected, but did you feel almost like that? Like you kind of knew it was going to happen when he, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is and part of is get... part of not sharing it? I just want to ask Nancy, is like part of not sharing it, were you intent do you think now looking back that there was some intention about like 
kind of trying to bury it just just so you didn't have to go there and think about it and feel it again resurface is that part of not sharing yeah i think there was a lot going on i think at five years old i was overwhelmed i didn't even know you know i I don't remember quite frankly and that's a lot of and people out there if you've gone through trauma if you're like me i have third person memories of my childhood you know there's a lot of gaps even as an adult my memory is still sort of a trauma memory and a trauma brain going on there with learning but the fact that i kept it secret either thought it was special or it was wrong and i kept it secret Mm -hmm. for so long like i said that yes it was expected and as i got older i was better at like trying to avoid it but like i said telling someone and saying no never occurred to me and it did get to that point where i thought i was as guilty as he was and people were going to be mad at me and hate me and be disgusted by me and a million other things when i went to therapy after i went to therapy court-ordered therapy and then eventually sought out my own therapist and in order to speak to her i literally had to pull the couch away from the wall sit behind the couch because i couldn't wow. tolerate like looking at her and someone seeing you while happened. you're talking yeah but her looking wow. at me because i was convinced she was going to be disgusted you know like I, i'm paying you you have mm-hmm. to listen but you're you're not going to be able to hide on your face that you're like completely grossed out by me right now and this yeah. is your blame me and how did i do this and so you know oh again gosh. i got the best of a of a worst case scenario and so i you know to confident complete answering your question, my core family was really safe. And my Mm -hmm. core childhood was really safe. Now, when my grandparents either came to visit us or we went to visit them, it tended to be long visits because of the distance. Those were the times. So in between, Mm -hmm. while I was still suffering the effects of trauma, I didn't see them the same way or experience them the same way, especially in my earlier life. And so Mm -hmm. who knows why I didn't tell I, i'm sure you know yeah. lots of it was locked away and went through all that kind of therapy to deal with everything but you know here i am at the summer program and people were doing things that they had no idea were mm-hmm. so powerful at the time so this woman whose name was moira kelly wherever she is she's you know an angel on my shoulder still to this mm-hmm. day she offered and said she asked she gave me a choice she gave me control. Mm-hmm. Do you want to tell or do you want us to tell? So here's the situation mm-hmm. that I've been solely in control of my entire life. And it's been life or death in my mind that I have control. Mm-hmm. And she's handing me back a little piece of control. And I don't think she ever realized that's what she was doing. And at the time, I didn't realize it. But I got to tell my parents. And I always say, you know, I don't say I have the best parents because I know there's a lot of people out there with really phenomenal parents. Yeah. Um, it's almost you know, like by making or, that or, statement, you're kind of like telling everyone, well, you don't have the best parents because right, I do, yeah, right? Yeah, you don't. You don't. <laughs> yeah. You don't. And whoever was the was that raised you, grandparent, aunt, sibling. But obviously, but like your parents had no idea. You're, you have siblings too no. that had no idea, right? I have an I have an older sibling, an older brother who did yeah. not know. My parents didn't know. And people were right. always shocked at that. Like, oh my gosh, as a parent, I would know. Oscar worthy performance. You have to remember yeah. that my, in my mind, my life depended on nobody knowing and making everything mm-hmm. seem okay. Now, that doesn't say that I wasn't a difficult child or that I didn't have difficulties in school with learning. There were some mm-hmm. things there. But other than that, I really was determined. And hey, listen, in fourth grade, I put on my first mask, if not before that, probably at five years old, but I like, mm-hmm. consciously put on my first mask of, okay. I remember being called into the principal's office and they had had psychoeducational testing on me for learning disabilities and having everything laid out in front of me on my test scores that I wasn't living up to my potential. Now, I did Mm -hmm. have a learning disability, but I was smart and I wasn't living up to my potential. And in that moment, I realized that if I make sure that on the outside is what adults expect to see from me, right, that Mm -hmm. I maintain that, then they're they're comfortable. Like they were uncomfortable that I wasn't matching what was on the paper. And therefore, if I could change to match the paper, they would be comfortable. When people are comfortable, they don't seek to find comfort. Which is training you to be, to to focus on the wrong things. It's like masking what's important, which Mm -hmm. is the inner work. So they can get the external to seem like it's checking a box. And on paper, you know, Oh, she's, she's improving, whatever. So there's that. The external looks good and we're fine. And then so many people kind of go through the life, you know, go through life or go through a cycle or a period of time where everything seemed good. She was happy. We had a great family mm-hmm. environment. You ask her award winning performance didn't show any signs that things weren't right. Cause you probably did you feel, let me ask you directly, like your grandfather's an authority figure whether he was or like you know some people mm-hmm, think yeah. authority means that someone's like oh i'm a dictator but like he's a he's your grandpa so you you know 
naturally look up to him and also know that like if you told on him, told on him like like we would say right. when we were a kid, that you didn't know what the repercussions were. So you basically were like, that's not an option. So I cannot allow right. that and to I was happen. I convinced the repercussions would be for me, right? I, I in my yeah. child brain, I was yeah. the one that was going to get. You're the one who did wrong. It. You're the you're the one who's going to get found out, and really, you mm-hmm. were not the one controlling that situation. So again, just trying to think about this, even as you right. grew up older, and you're now nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and a little bit older than that. When this is going on, it still was this thing of like the authority versus me, and, and you know. And, and um, well, and you were I just trying to fix you know, the external, right? Right. I just didn't yeah. want anyone to find out. It just didn't. That was I. I just didn't want anyone to find out. That was the big thing. Mm-hmm. And you know, for me, I thought I was unlovable. I thought I was broken beyond repair. So if I told people what was going on, what was going to happen, right? They were going to abandon me. They were going to hate me. They were gonna, whatever it was. You know, in your mind, you create a narrative that's so strong. And was so different. And so I, I'm not a right, wrong person, but it was so wrong compared to what really happened. So my parents, I call them from the summer program. I'm out of town and I've still got a few weeks left. And I'm, I'm on the phone telling them that, you know, my grandfather's been inappropriate with me. And I just, like I said, I don't, I have the best parents for me. Like I was given mm-hmm. the absolute best parents for me because mm-hmm. I know they were devastated and struggling with throughout the whole process you know this wasn't just this one phone call that with their own you know we didn't protect our child how do we not know same thing what do we do how do we help her and I, it was hard to look at me i was a mess you know as a parent mm-hmm. you could see that i was in pain and suffering and, and we'll get to more of that story later you know pieces where it was more obvious but they offered me another choice and never another area of control i was very happy and safe at the summer program having a great summer and they said do you want us to come get you and i said no i i'm, mm-hmm. I'm happy and safe here. And so mm-hmm. they gave me the option, right? That that I could, the, the unsaid message was that I could be trusted making decisions, that I mm-hmm. that I could, I could keep myself safe, that I, you know, didn't nobody had to step in and take over for me. I just needed to, you know, I had a lot of unlearning to do for sure. Yeah. But there wasn't something inherently, you know, broken or wrong with me that I couldn't, that I had to be swept home and taken care of and put in a bubble. Yeah, I want to jump in for a second and say, like, amazing on your parents. Maybe they didn't even realize that, like you said, giving you this option was so important to you or important to the healing process. But, you know, a lot of parents would have just showed up at camp after that call and said, Get, jump in the car, we're taking care of this, or we got to either address this or protect you because they think they're doing the right thing and they want to do the right thing. And they may, you know, believe that that's the right thing. But then all of a sudden, now what that's doing is like the fact that the this got out there. And you were protecting it for so long, and now all of a sudden, th- you're like your your fun with your friends is t- taken away from you, and now it can confront you know confronting your grandfather's coming up, and it's all the stuff that you're like, this is why I was protecting it because this is just mm-hmm. not what I wanted to happen. Where your parents allowed you to continue to have fun with your friends and at the camp that right it didn't take away the things in my life that were good which is which is amazing that they allowed that to happen yeah so just parents parents listening take notes i'm taking notes you are yeah incredible and you know the other thing that happened was it gave them time to process without me seeing which was really valuable because i felt like you know, I had done this to everyone and, you know, you don't want, I, I know they went through their struggles and it gave them time to come up with a game plan and, 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 you know, find, find what needed to be done next and all that and start to process on their own. Because if I would have seen all of that devastation, which I saw plenty of it as we mm-hmm. went through the process, you know, uh, that was something I had to unlearn, unlearn. Again, this was not me. I was not causing this pain, but that's a hard one. So it gave us a little space to process. It gave, again, they they gave me this choice and it didn't have to spill over into the things that were good in my life. It was still this thing, right? It, 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 mm. it can never stay that contained. But in that moment, as far as a disclosure goes, I had a really good situation and experience. So fast forward, my parents picked me up. We, you know, we're, we're, traveling down this path together. And the very condensed version is, you know, I very quickly became very controlling with my food, which is not unusual. I had lost control of everything else. I can control what goes into my body. Part of it was control. And part of it was that I, my body had betrayed me. 
And these are the things that are hard to hear more so than that it happened, but are so important for people who have been through this to hear someone say is that, you know, my body did exactly what it was meant to do, right? Sexual touch equals pleasure. That's the way we're programmed. That's what's supposed to happen. We're supposed to be able to experience that. Now, that's what happened. And you can imagine it's so hard for people to hear like, oh, on some level, my abuse was pleasurable physically. Right. But for it to be so in, at odds with, you know, the emotional and, and, and cognitive piece that was going on. And so I hated my body for betraying me. So why feed it? Why, mm -hmm. why would I? sustain it? Why would I nourish it? Mm. And the other part was I wanted to disappear. I am thankful that I never had true suicidal ideation, but I was okay with dying. I was totally fine yeah. with getting hit by a bus. Um, if someone was going to get a terminal cancer diagnosis tomorrow, give it to me instead. Let them wow. live out their happy, joyful life without this. You know, and I was in end of high school, beginning of college at this point. And Mm -hmm. really, really struggling. I, um, most of you, if you catch it on YouTube, you can see me now. I was 15 pounds lighter than I am now. And I'm not a big yeah. human. I there's, mean, there's I, not many I'm, pounds I'm not, to, to reduce from. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I'm not tiny. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm an average human with 15 pounds less would be really scary to yeah. see. And so became anorexic over the course of some time went off to college as anorexic and really started to have to confront these issues around like my senior year of high school when relationships and dating and then going off to college you know that came into play where there were some really big places of um, hurt and trauma that just started to rear their head you know and trust mm -hmm. issues and you know again this this confusion between you know my body and my brain and stuff that took a lot of like roll up your sleeves and do hard work you know ugly snotty unsexy work and so you know I go off to college and I decide that I and I don't remember making the decision and I don't remember why but something within me and I've always had this voice which I'm always so grateful for that's like keep going you don't want to give him another minute, which was what came up after I confronted my grandfather. I decided to confront him. And mm -hmm. my you know, sophomore year at George Washington University, now I had been that, like, look at the outside, everything's great. President of my class, captain of the volleyball team. I was on scholarship to the George Washington University in D.C. on a five-year undergrad master's program for communication disorders and sciences. Like, Yeah, man, there's that I, external. I you it. were crushing the external. Again. I, I had yeah. got it buttoned up buttoned up and looking good but yeah. like on the inside i was a mess if you look too closely forget it but you know here i am mm -hmm. and you know putting that college mask was another mask i have a closet full of masks you know i always joke when i do my keynotes that you know it's like that gorgeous pair of shoes that you want to love and wear but you put them on and you they kill you and you, you you can't take another step it's not that once we get rid of the mask they disappear and we don't try yeah. them on from one from time to time you know we fall back into things but they just don't fit and they're not comfortable anymore and being aware and recognizing yeah. that but i decided to confront my grandfather and so they lived out of state and i went there with both my mom and dad flew with me and i ended up confronting him and it was the precipitating event to my first major depressive episode i mm. confronted him and he admitted to one instance of being inappropriate with me. And it was something I hadn't remembered. So there are a lot of things that happened that day. Yes, I got to confront my grandfather and I'm grateful I got to do that. But I also was flooded with all sorts of overwhelm in terms of, if I don't remember this, what else don't I remember? Whoa. Do I have yeah. to remember it all, right? In order to heal? And can I handle remembering it all? Like I was having mm -hmm. a hard enough time. Was it the four of you? I'm just trying to picture this this moment where well, right, it would have been right. five, right? Your parents and yourself, oh, plus your grandparents, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, so was everybody like together in the living room or something, sitting down and like it just boom it hit, or how did that how did that actually happen? Right. So we had told my grandparents the night before that we were coming to see, you know, coming to see them. And my grandfather must have known because he wasn't there when we got there. So I, mm. we, because I'm sure it was torture for my parents as well, had to wait. And wow, what a, what a, an opportunity to decide if you really want to do this or not. And my dad actually offered, I was, you know, my grandmother had the split level fridge, the freezer and the fridge. And I guess at some point food had always been, you know, a blessing and a curse for me through sure. the process. And I was waist deep in her fridge, like just 
finding anything like to, I, nothing was going to make me feel better, but anything. Uh-huh. I could. And I remember my dad sort of peeking over the door and saying, we don't have to stay. We can leave. And looking uh-huh. at him. And again, this voice inside of me that I'm incredibly grateful for saying, no, because if I leave, I'll never come back and I need to do this. Mm-hmm. So when my grandfather did finally come home, yes, we were all sitting in the living room and the intention was, hey, listen, my mom and dad know this. This is not something I'm keeping secret anymore. I'm not holding your shame and your secret. I've done the work. We're going to have this conversation. And he asked, could we have the conversation in private in the other room? And at first I was like, yeah. no, like that wasn't the plan. I'm not ready. And I thought, you know what? Yeah, that's fine. And I said to him, that's fine. We can do that. But no, anything you tell me. I'm coming back here and telling my mom and dad, like there's yeah. no secrets anymore. It, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. not an option. Did so your grandma know yet a, or no, she didn't know yet. She didn't know yet. And it was, okay. that was into this day, still the most devastating piece of the story for me, quite frankly. Um, mm-hmm. And this is it. Part of healing doesn't mean you get rid of all the pain. You don't, it just doesn't hit you. The she same had way to be, time. but my, I was the, I mean, you think of the most shocked person as far as maybe being like, thinking you know somebody really well and finding out they're this totally different person had to be that wake up call for her too right and they were a generation where like like i love lucy i think they they slept in different beds it wasn't the same sort of thing and so maybe she knew maybe she didn't i don't know but what i know is i was the youngest of all the grandkids and i always got left behind and so i Uh was really really close with my grandmother and this was devastating for her Uh just on so many levels and so in being able to maintain boundaries with my grandfather, it meant that I had to have unintended boundaries with my grandmother that kept us from being as close as we had once been for many years. Mm -hmm. But I did confront him and told my parents and, you know, quote unquote, went on our merry way with where now I have this thing of, oh my gosh, I don't remember everything. Do I need to know? How can I possibly know? And the other piece that happened was, I had done all the work in therapy to go, this isn't my fault. This is your shame, your problem. You yeah. did this. Fine. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm flying to you and putting this in your lap. And my grandfather took responsibility and nothing changed for me. You know, one of the uh-huh. devastating pieces of trauma is that regardless, like it's not your fault. That doesn't take away the work that you have to do to become whole. Right. And D- you didn't feel any so lift of, of weight at all after that? like on the way home you didn't feel you didn't feel somewhat lift of like it's finally over the the hiding the because like the oscar performances can take a break for a minute there was no none of that huh i i wish i could say that and to people who are thinking about confronting their abuser i'm not saying don't do it because it doesn't immediately feel good maybe it will for someone for me there was just so much more that came up around you know this piece of i really don't know what happened yeah. here this right. piece of recognizing that and putting boundaries in place with my grandfather the reality you know of what that meant for my relationship with my grandmother and the piece of where i naively and and knew it wasn't really going to go away but now like you know you you go for something 100 percent, it doesn't happen then you know what the outcome is the outcome is this is mine I'm saddled with all this and I went home very heavy I actually returned to George Washington for a little bit Again, first major depressive episode. I couldn't get out of bed. I was crying. I remember yeah. calling my brother. With my parents being terrified and not knowing what to do. My brother and I are very close. And so I called him and you know was talking to him. And I'm like, I can do it. I can do it. He's like, you can, but you don't have to. You know, like that thing. And, and I remember him saying to me, close your eyes and, and think about staying there. And what feelings came up? He said, like, close your eyes and think about going home. And what feelings came up? And it was very clear that I was not meant to be there at that time. And having the conversation with him of, well, what do I tell people? Like, I can't drop out of college, right? And it's taken mm-hmm. me years to say I dropped out of college, right? For for years, yeah. it was I, I, yeah. I left, just, I took a break. Because of what comes, <laughs> no, I dropped out. what comes with the perception of it. Yeah, there's this p- right. perception, like, even though it was tell what you needed to do. I couldn't yeah. academically handle it, right? I couldn't academically yeah. handle it. I was a year and a half into this rigorous program, had been doing fine. That yeah. I didn't like it socially. A year and a half into this program and loved it and everyone knew. And so just even, you know, again, the, the worrying about the outside narrative so much. And, mm-hmm. and it's normal. And if you're worrying about your outside narrative, I'm not judging you at all. I went through the same thing and there's a time and place for everything in each part of your story. So when you're ready, you will be ready. You may never be without fear or anxiety, but you'll know you're ready to share that next piece and take that next step. So I did end up coming home. I dropped out and I didn't need a story to to tell people because the reality was I was in bed unless 
I went to therapy individually three times a week or once for group. That's all I did Mm -hmm. for many months when I came home. That's what I could handle. And again, incredibly fortunate to have found a therapist. This is the woman who I sat behind her couch and it got to the point where she would move the couch before I came. You know, like she taught me what the therapy environment really can and should be in terms of my ownership of it, my comfort, you know, the person really being the expert in some things, but not the expert in me. I was Mm -hmm. still the expert in me, but she was going to bring her expertise to help me heal. And Suzanne Drake Kilduff, who's still around and I spoke to several years ago, actually, I actually called her and two other therapists that were in my my growth over the years to let them know. It has to feel so good for them to see how vibrant you are and full of life and amazing things that you're helping people out, man. It has to feel good. Yeah, they were. You know, you think about how, I mean, Suzanne knew me when I was you know, 18 to 20 something. Right. It's Um, literally like 180 transition. Oh yeah. And where they found you into where you're at now. Yeah. So that many years later, I pick up the phone to call. I don't believe that by the way. I I think, I think that's BS. (laughs) I would, I'd still put you on. Someone's lying to me. (laughs) I could, I'd put you at maybe 33 at the oldest if I had to guess. Oh, so you had me, you You know, there was a point in time where I, Thank you. There's a point in time where I would deny my age, but I've gotten to the point where I've lived and earned every year of this. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to own it. <laughs> yeah. No, I um, think you, know, you look given great. This life so. to live. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And so I called her and she remembered details. I mean, this is 30 years, 20 years later. And she remembered details. She remembered me. And again, making people feel seen, heard, loved, and valued, right? If, if, ever, I already knew the power of that, but ever I needed a reminder calling this woman and her remembering, you know, my family and my situation and being thrilled. And the other two therapists were my more recent past. So it wasn't as, you know, surprising to me, but still, you know, you call people you haven't worked with in years and they remember Mm -hmm. you and and are excited for you. I wrote a chapter for a book on finding, how do you know you found your therapist? Right. And I mentioned these three women and how they gave me this environment to really be my own and, and work within in all sorts of different ways. And there we can get into that another time or, you know, the chapter in the book, you guys can find it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's going to be out there soon where they taught me and showed me what, right. What the environment supposed to be, what a good therapist does, because if you're like a lot of people, you go to your therapist, just like I did. And you lie to them, right. When you don't have the right one, you lie, you hold back, you don't feel safe. You're not going to get vulnerable. You're go- I was going to therapy. I was doing my work, mm-hmm. but I was getting nowhere. Still I wearing masks. Yeah. Different, different yeah, masks. St- even with my yeah. therapist, right. Even with my therapist through my marriage, you know, mm-hmm. there I, even then with people in my life that were my closest friends or my ex-husband, I, Again, didn't until I told my story on LinkedIn in front of nearly whatever, 8 billion people. I had talked to people in my environment about it, but I'd never given my story its own life, its own legs, its own, you know, life Mm -hmm. to live really where I wasn't there. People were going to hear it and I wasn't there and I didn't know them. And while we talk about what a great gift is for everyone else and truly that's why I do what I do, there's no denying what a privilege and gift it's been for me, you know, you tell your story and you know Mm -hmm. that it's going to help people, Mm -hmm. but to have people reach out to me and share with me everything from, I've never told anyone, not even my husband. I had a woman's husband contact me saying, I want to support her. She's going through this. You know, what can you, what can I do to people who decided to sell their story after seeing me tell mine? And, like I said, there are a lot of things, Michelle. There are a lot of things in life that I have been gifted. But if I have helped one person, right? Mm-hmm. I, I there's no greater quote unquote success. My bank account will never show it. You know, mm-hmm. there's going to be no award that can reflect that. That mm-hmm. my story, I always knew, was bigger than me, and my ability and my bravery and the right conditions hitting of me being ready and able to tell it. You know, I speak on stages about masks and radiating real and finding our voice and the power of, you know, personal content on stages and Mm. share my, share my story, you know, which I never would have thought possible. And what a magical, beautiful privilege to have been given, right? You look at this trauma and just for me to say, I'm grateful for it and think it was a privilege to people who haven't been there think, how is that even possible? It's so hard to wrap our minds around that. Mm -hmm. And 
it, 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 it takes years and years of healing and years and years of being real and telling the right therapist. And if you don't have the right one, finding the right one and having mm -hmm. hopefully a support system at home and a brother you can lean on. Everyone else, it's a different maybe family member, a best friend, or the 16-year-old girl that listened to you at camp that was kind of the catalyst and finally like being able to take the right step forward. There's so many different variables that come into it. Everyone has their own unique situation and way that it un unfolds. Out of all the interviews I've done, I know talking about trauma in this particular situation is extremely heavy, but I wanted to do it today because I knew, like you just said moments ago, helping one person, it's worth it. It's worth the energy, the time. It's worth going back to a tough spot and like rehashing it again. I know you've told the story many times, but each time it still has a little bit of that cutting it open again, like, ah, here it is again. Um, I've heard it now. This is my second time hearing your story. It's not lighter this time around. Like, oh, we could just talk about it easy. So uh, it's it's extremely heavy on my heart. I just want to say thank you for opening up again. Radiating Real. I'm, that's going to be the name of this episode. Radiating Real. <laughs> Nancy Barrows. You're such a powerful person. And I just appreciate that you were willing and able to to get to this place of sharing your story to help others. Thank you for doing it with our audience Thank today. You. There's one other of thing course. I want to share. Before we go, can I yeah. just say two more things quickly? As I want yeah, I want you that, to, like, to, to and, wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. This healing and, and, and mental wellness, like where I show up today, if you caught me on a different morning, it would be different. We don't get to a point and put a plaque on our wall and we're done. Right. Mm -hmm. It's still it's still a daily practice. So please, when you quote unquote slip or however you words you use to beat yourself up, understand that that's human and normal. And it's an opportunity for you to use your new skills and show yourself that you really do know what to do here. And you really are that person. It's not that you you were you know, an imposter. You really are right. that in person, that person who is just like me, susceptible to everything that everybody else is, but that I have these tools that I can employ, hence chick with the tool belt, to get myself back on track. It might be a day, a week, a month, but I I, I know I'm going to get there, right? So I don't want people yeah. to think if if they have a bad day or, you know, I was anorexic for years. There's still days that I'll get to like one o'clock, realize I haven't eaten. And every mm -hmm. once in a while, the voice in my head goes, eh, you can make it to two o'clock. Right. And I go, mm -mm, wait, nope, stopping yeah. right now. I need to retrain you know, that, that retrain that thought. Yeah. Right. That awareness and that commitment to leaving that mask on the side of the road, wherever you left it, not going back to pick it up. That's hugely important. And thank you. I it's, it's an honor and privilege to share my story every time I do. And for everyone out there that's angry and upset, I am going to thank you, because if I held on to all of that, Mm. I never would have gotten here. And so I am grateful to you for holding the anger for me and uh, allowing me to not hold on to it so that I could get to where I am today and, and yeah. continuing to go and continue to go. It's a privilege. I mean, I was Without sharing my story, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be now preparing for a keynote in September in Pennsylvania to talk about radiating real. And the funny part is, it's, it's the, the event is showing up perspectives on cancer. And mm -hmm. thankfully, I don't have an intimate connection to cancer, but the event host saw the value, right, in, in sharing a mm -hmm. story. And how powerful that is. And so what I want and, and asked me to be the keynote on September 10th, but what I want to leave everybody else with is to me as weird as this may sound, my story is not remarkable because I lived it. Like I know all this and I know how the ending goes and I know it's not remarkable, but to somebody else hearing it, it is. And they'll hear it mm -hmm. when they need to hear it and they'll take from it what they need to take. And the true is same for everyone out there. Each mm -hmm. and every one of us has an impactful, important, powerful story to be told. And that's why I said in the beginning, don't compare yours to mine. It's not a comparison. Right. There's no report card. There's no scale. Whatever your personal story is, whether you share all of it, little pieces of it, or start through your personal content. Again, share a picture of your cat. I'm going to call to action. Hey, guys, everyone out there, share something <laughs> personal, whether you share it's your favorite movie or mm -hmm. a picture of something in nature that you like. Hashtag Radiating Real. And please tag me because yeah. I will be there with the unconditional love and acceptance. And I can say with 99% certainty, because no one that I have ever worked with, whether it be a client or a friend or a corporation that has started sharing personal content 
ever has come back to me and say, you know what, biggest mistake of my life, I regret it. Yeah, It just doesn't happen. So go ahead, take that picture. Go ahead, share something about yourself. You know, share. Uh, this is how you connect with people. You know that people are going to be there that have similar interests. And there you go. You're starting to build this amazing community that allowed me to have the support to do what I'm doing and eventually be named, you know, one of LinkedIn's top 50 most impactful people. Like that's, that's <sighs> insane, but everybody has that opportunity. So please post something personal. Again, personal and private are different. Tag me and hashtag Radiating Real and I will find you and you will be part Somebody. of our Radiating Real family, which is global. Give me the heart. This is, uh, I, I almost feel like I'm, I don't think I've ever been in a loss, a loss for words, just trying to find the right words to, to match you in this, this, this uh, energy that I feel when you just shared that. All I can say is, you know, it's beautiful what you're doing and the way that you're helping people out and something that I know you're not here looking for today or have looked for in the past is um, verification in, in your, you know, who you are and, and what you've achieved in your life. And you're not looking for the trophies or the awards. But I do want to say something you may have not been told or at least in a long time. I know in college you said, and I, I mentioned it as like part of your external mask was that you were doing really well and in high school uh, but look at this little girl that was kind of having having some difficulties in school right you were you're struggling a little bit and likely connected to the whole thing of what was going on in your personal life and you end up like allowing like becoming this 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 beautiful person who also was able to put it together academically and all this stuff that's extremely difficult for anybody and especially, you know, you mentioned having like a learning disability. I did as well. I had a hard time with reading comprehension when I was little and they put me in special classes and they took me out of regular class, which meant that I was... I still don't know my Titans tables by heart. Okay. Let's yeah. be real. I mean, we're radiating. <laughs> I never exactly. got them. <laughs> yeah. I read at a third, a third grade level, maybe worse. So whenever I read, I highlight and I have to reread like each page three times to learn it. But my point in sharing this is like, your story is so powerful and impactful that we, 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 cling on to that but look at the other beautiful like even without the your story with your grandpa like you were someone who in, in your younger years was kind of struggling academically and figured it out and and was amazing incredible in school all kinds of great accolades and like we kind of just ran through it really quick to get back to the story and i don't want to do that i want to make sure that we say nancy you're freaking incredible and in all the things that you've achieved including becoming real and how, teaching people how to radiate the realness of their story to help others to be transparent to not hide behind it anymore peel the masks off it's super painful it's super difficult it feels impossible in the moment but um like i said the reason i asked you the story about when you told when you confronted your grandpa when you left that day did you feel weight as i was just curious to kind of wonder what that moment felt like but the thing is you said no and that's okay because I don't want everyone feel, uh, listening in to say like, oh, well, she she did the confrontation, but there wasn't like a weight lifted. So maybe I shouldn't share. It's not that. It's that then you're able to almost like a clean slate, start to rebuild your story. Your heart was being pieced back together one piece at a time and look at where you're, you're at today. And you were able to go back Absolutely. now and share your beautiful that story. That confrontation was the day that I decided I wasn't giving him a minute more of my life, mm -hmm. right? There was, there was a catalyst there. Now it was not fun right. by any means, but it was the catalyst. And you could now you think, move forward. You were able to, you were able right, to have you, progress you, up until that point. That you have to get to rock bottom, right? You have to get to rock bottom. It's not just true about addictions. There's a uh -huh. lot of things in life where we have to decide that we want to fight because this is not what we're willing to accept. Right. And it's not just with trauma, you know, it's, it's throughout our lives. And yeah. that was the, that was the moment for me where I said, I'm not giving this man a minute more. One more life. second. Yeah. A lot of people experience that in business second. that they're just, I've done it too. I've, you, you hit these moments of like, Literally, there's no no even room to go backwards. You're on the ground level. You yeah. can't even go down. You're, right. you're as low as the elevator goes. But there's only one direction, and it's to continue to build and make these micro wins and, and keep building your heart. And um, a whole other topic. I I'm so gonna... hope we have the opportunity to talk again because that whole education topic is actually near and dear to me. I went into education to for that reason because of my experiences right right and and a lot of the other reasons that i didn't know were driving it but well i'll tell you what nancy you're already invited back on mic'd up or you're going to come on Thank for a second you. episode because there's another topic aside from the education being able to 
um, any child, myself included, I can share a little bit more of my story about struggling. And then some of the, like, I did really well in high school. It was once a teacher, I'll share my story on the show when, when we do that interview, about a teacher who saw my greatness in me and she was willing to work mm-hmm. with me in a different way so I can unlock it. It was like the door just had this crazy lock on it and no teacher up until that point was willing to help me figure out how to open it. It was just, it just sat there on, on, unlocked or locked, Seen, right? Seen, heard, loved and valued. Somebody Seen, heard, time, loved and valued. Right? Exactly. So we want to talk about grab. that. Yeah. But I want to also say, Nancy, um, the other thing I want to talk about is having a voice and you teach people on how to use and have their voice. So we touched on that a little bit today, but that I'd love, love to go in that direction for our next interview and talk about learning how to use your voice and the power of our voice and also the power of transformation. And just because where we start when we're children has no indication of where we end up. Look at Einstein. And there's so many people I can, I can think about, like successful entrepreneurs that at one point in time were basically told they were, they were going to be nothing. And then they end up being incredible human beings, just in a different way that society doesn't identify. Exactly. Them. But when you break yourself out of the shackles of societal norms, you can really thrive. Yeah, when you decide what's right for you, rather mm-hmm. than everybody else deciding what's right for you, it's a very powerful catalyst, truly. And I want to, I'm going to show the business card quickly. I want to invite everyone to come. Brian Shulman and I have two global winning, award-winning live shows that we do on Wednesdays. What's Good Wednesday? Every Wednesday, uh, easiest to find us on LinkedIn at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and every Saturday at 9 a.m. Yeah. Pacific Standard Time. And I ask you to come because they're both places of gratitude. Shout out Saturday, someone who's made a difference, positive impact. What's good Wednesday? Let's share the good. And all of our guests, and there's a little QR code where you can actually scan and get all the link tree information. Yeah, but it's awesome. all of our guests come from the comments. It's okay. open to anyone who wants to come join us. And there's some beautiful, magical things that happen. And if you're not sure you want to join first, come join in the comments. There's a beautiful community in the comments. And, you know, the Positive Vibe Tribe, as we tell them, are the most amazing, welcoming, heart-centered group of people. So if you have a minute and want to join us, please do. If you're not ready to join us live, don't worry. We'll get you there. We always do for people who think they're afraid and can't. And doing something that you think you're afraid of and can't do and talking about using your voice and having your voice and finding your voice, mm-hmm. a lot of that happens here. So I, I know we said we were going to go and we were wrapping up a million times and I will really allow you to do that now. No, thank you so much. Uh, this is something that I, I don't want the conversation to end because I really feel like I just love helping people out. And, you know, I'm your first, I'm the first audience member of Mic'd Up. I sit back and I learn and I really um, take it, I soak it all up and just, this is such a powerful message that it's not one I wanted to just, I said the word wrap up, but it wasn't like, Hey, Nancy, hurry up. I wasn't like, you know, the stand up comedian yeah. where they like, they wave the candle and <laughs> they're like, the light at you. Yeah. Two, two more jokes. No, it wasn't, it wasn't that it was more so like put a, put a bow on it and kind of say like, okay, this is like the, the, you know, bookend of this conversation, but it's just still chapter one of our, our um, friendship and our, con- you know, our conversations among the two of us, but also for our audiences, our joint audiences, we'll bring them together. We're stronger together. And um, I want people to go to voiceyourvibe.com. Check out your uh, your live shows and, and um, connect with you. And actually Please start do. to be... Please send me a connect request on LinkedIn. I encourage everybody send to... send it with a note. Send it with a note that you saw me here. Here's one of the places that you can start to build and engage in your community. And one of the ways that I became, you know, the mm-hmm. queen of engagement, known as the queen of engagement in top 50 send a note with your connect request. Say you saw me yeah. here. You can say something inspired. You don't even have to get that personal. Just like, Hey, I saw you, heard you, whatever it was mm-hmm. on, you know, mic'd up and wanted to reach out and connect. Yeah. It's, there's some, you know, there's something about being personal, right. funny enough, that makes the difference. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to give someone an offer, not that I want to need to do this or have to do this or anything, but if you hashtag radiating real and mic'd up in the same post and share something that can inspire it's your pick of a, a mic'd up Be Great, Be Grateful hat, signature hat. I can get you a Be Great, Be Grateful mug, which isn't even on our website. This is like a custom jobber. Uh, we got the, the Be Kind t-shirts. We have Be Great, Be Grateful t-shirts, Be Bold. So if you hashtag Radiating Real and mic'd up, um, you'll be kind of entered in. And I'm going to choose uh, one winner to to be able to rock out some of the mic'd up merch, which 
These are all available on our website, mikedupmerch.com. 100% of the profits are going to charity. And many of the charities that I'm connected with are, it's either helping out, you know, women, children, any, any, any group that there's uh, something that is like close to my heart. Like a, a lot of these organizations that are helping with anti-sex trafficking, that's a big thing that I'm an advocate to, you know, find any movement that can help that cause. Cause it's like a lot of people are uncomfortable just talking about it and it's happening right in front of us here in the USA. Like people don't realize it's happening on our soil and it just nobody ta- wants to talk about it. And so that's what you're, that's what, you, what, what we're moving forward and pushing through. So hashtag rating and real and mic'd up. Can you? Do I get to play? Because I've got Smile Project Louisville. I've got yeah, Kind of Inspired. I've got, you know, if there's an R in the heart, I've got all sorts of stuff that I, uh, that I uh, put out there. Ecam. There's a yeah. bunch of other things. But uh, we can, this do, is, am I allowed to play? Is that th- fair? This is, you can play. This is, um, Literally, uh, our first conversation has been recorded, but we're going to have many more opportunities where the two of us come together to connect. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy. This is absolutely amazing today. And I thank just really you. appreciate your heart and uh, the way that you help people out. It's you, You're one of a kind. And you, you're you. That's what's most important. That you're actually being you, and I can appreciate that. And uh, radiating real. You really delivered it today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I look forward to uh, joining you again and continuing to learn and grow with one another. I'd like to give a huge shout out to everyone for tuning in, especially those who listen all the way to the end to hear this message. Seriously, I appreciate you and my guests do as well. Giving a quick reminder to subscribe to this show. It's completely free and will allow you to receive notifications when new episodes are released. If you'd like to provide a tip as a gift, you can do so via patreon.com backslash mic'd up. It's spelled M-I-K-E-D up. Patreon.com backslash mic'd up. You can give as little as $1 per month or as much as you'd like. Every dollar is greatly appreciated and completely unexpected. Appreciate your reviews and your messages coming in on social as well keep them coming your feedback is valuable and absolutely means the world to me you can check out more episodes and content at mikeduppodcast.com we're powered by social chameleon you can also follow me on instagram that's where i'm the most active and it's at mike dichocho m-i-k-e-d-i-c-i-o-c-c-i-o thank you so much for your continued support you guys know what to do be great and be grateful